go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Steve Isaacs. Dr. Isaacs is with the University of Kentucky. He's an ag economist under the Ag and uh, College of Agriculture. Uh, his focus over the years has been in farm management. He uh, manages the Ag Leadership Program there at the University. Works directly with extension agents uh, with Ag Econ type programs and activities. Does some teaching at uh, the college. Uh, and he's from the University of Tennessee, so he takes some ribbing from us. And he gives it out as well. And uh, so uh, in the past several years, he's been very much a part of the farm transitions programs that we have done in cooperation with uh, the university and, and throughout the state of Kentucky. So uh, today he's going to switch, I think, his PowerPoints up a little bit uh, based on some early discussion. <laughs> but what I want you to understand, we're actually starting to build, as farmers say, a toolbox. So David has done a wonderful job of giving you some ideas and laying some groundwork and questions that you need to ask. So we're going to build on that. And then after lunch, then we'll begin, begin to put into place some of the more <clears throat> direct things as far as the state planning side of this that you need to understand and learn. So, uh, Steve, it's all yours, sir. All right, thanks a lot. Always good to be here. Yes, I've heard all the Tennessee jokes there are on Tennessee Square Orange. Take the roof of all on Saturday, deer hunt on Sunday, and hunt. Pick up crash the roadside the rest of the week. <laughs> well, you have to have 32 Tennessee women and a full set of people. So, uh, <laughs> so I have heard all of these. But it, I think I have. If you don't want me to have it, uh, I'm, I'm getting to it. Uh, David Maris and I have worked on several of these transition type workshops over the years at different locations uh, around the state and, and, and other places. Uh, always interesting, always important stuff. Uh, because of the nature of the things that we do in the farm management area, there's probably going to be some redundancy. I'm going to say some things he's already said. That probably means they're real important, right? So, so if you hear some redundancy, that's fine. I'm going to mention a few things and talk, take a little bit different tack than, than David did. Because we, we do these uh, in our respective states and, and to lots of audiences. One thing I would say is sometimes we, we tend to talk and we think about some of the larger commercial operations that, that are the ones that we often get calls from about how do we do this, how do we do this right. Uh, if, if you're not the big commercial operation, this is still important. And it may be harder. Because sometimes, I, I mean, I have seen some of these knockdown, drag out, falling outs in a family over pictures, a water pitcher, or a piano, or a piece of furniture, or a quilt. These are things that can, can break families apart. So, so I don't think size really has much to do with it. The principles are the same, and I think David mentioned uh, maybe before we were, when we were getting ready or earlier today uh, that it, I guess when it started out that it's not just farms. You know, any kind of business or any family that's in transition, I think this is important to do. So, uh, uh, so I think in agriculture, this is really interesting because. But I don't think there's any industry that has a stronger tradition <coughs> or sense of heritage or legacy or these things we use. And some of these kind of terms we use, like home place, you, I heard you guys say sixth generation farm, or fourth generation farm, or fifth generation farm, or multiple generations farming together. I work with an attorney out of Central Kentucky on some of these workshops, and he has one of the greatest little visuals. I should carry this around, but I'm not doing a session with him and just steal it from him because I am a believer in extension R&D. That's rip off and duplicate. <laughs> so, so I'm going to rip this off from an attorney I work with. He comes up to the podium. He says he has, has a little toy tractor. And his farm body says, how many of you give your kids these little toys? And you know, farm, everybody. Yeah, we, our farm kids grow up with farm toys. He said, well, what do attorneys do? Do they give their kids little bitty miniature legal pads? <laughs> You know, we start out at a very young age with this notion of legacy and heritage, but then sometimes it falls apart when we actually do it. It's an important part of our culture. This sort of reiterates some of the things that David said. Uh, more than half of Americans don't have a will. 20% of Farm Journal uh, uh, respondents said they weren't confident in their succession plan, and an outfit out of New England said 88% of farm owners didn't even have an exit plan. So it gets kind of muddled. This is something that David has. Uh, that farm businesses have a 30% or one-third chance of surviving second to first to second generation and only half of those surviving to the third generation. 
That's the 30% or 15% I think that David had on the slide earlier today. This line at the bottom. This is the one I want to talk about. He's going to talk about communication this afternoon. You can't do this in any family or business without having communication. So I'm going to let him, he does an excellent job, as you've already seen, in, in communicating, and he's going to communicate about communicating this afternoon. This line I've got at the bottom of this slide, that is the best conversation killer I've ever seen in my life. Because when somebody in an older generation says, don't worry, I'll take care of you, what that really means is, don't ask me again. I don't want to talk about this. And, and several times already today, we've talked about how difficult this conversation is to start. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how my wife started it with her mother. She said, okay, Mom. And she, we tried several times. You know, get her started. We worked with a financial planner. You know, it just wasn't working well. So my wife finally sat down with her and said, okay, Mom, let's just start at the end. What songs do you want at your funeral? And then they backed into it. That conversation that you were talking about that was difficult with your dad <laughs> on his deathbed. My wife, who's just a very in-your-face kind of person anyway, and she just sat down and said, okay, let's, let's go to the end. What songs do you want? And so they planned out the funeral, and they, they backed into some things. It is a difficult conversation to start. It's not one that, because it's hard, certainly, that we, you know, we should have. But this is the one that I encourage parents and grandparents, don't, don't say this. You know, because this just kills the conversation. Now, I'm going to take, because I'm a management guy, I, I teach farm management or ag management at the University of Kentucky, I teach a human resource management class, so that's my area. I want to talk a little bit about the management side of this, and Dave alluded some of it as well, about transferring management. This afternoon, we'll get into, and several of you mentioned some things about wills and trusts and state plans and, and business organizations. Those are important tools. Those are important things to do. We know how to do those. And we have the resources with financial planners and, and legal aids and accountants and tax uh, 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 advisors. We can do that. That's sort of a mechanistic kind of thing that we can do. Oftentimes, the harder thing to do is to transfer the management. They've already alluded to that. I'm going to talk more about it. Because that notion of having that 82-year-old or 91-year-old father that, or grandfather that wants to control everything and not give up to the very end, that's, that's the tough part. So I want to talk more about management and about how to transfer the management more so than I do about transferring the assets. We will get into that this afternoon, and that's, and that's the very part of it. Now, with that, the old, and I'm a collector of old books. I, and one of the things I like to collect is old farm management books. And farm management text for years and years, we used to talk about this life cycle of the farm business. And it had this sort of entry, growth, exit. And this was almost a linear approach. Now, David had a, a, a graph there that did a real good job with that, about showing the, the growth phases of the business, the maturity of the business. And, and this was something that you could go back into farm management books in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and they would talk about this. You enter by being a tenant or buying a little bit of land and, and then growing the business and acquiring more land and then exit at some point in time, either voluntarily or involuntarily, and it was almost viewed as a linear process. And for an individual, it makes some sense because it is chronological. You do that with age. I want to contend that, that it really is not just a linear process. It's happening all the time, and particularly as we have more multi-generational businesses where we're farming with <coughs> sons and daughters or nephews or cousins that there may be people coming and going in and out of business all the time. And this doesn't have to be a big business. Several of you were describing it, uh, almost all of you said you had small farms, but several of you talked about farming with your parents or, your, or, or coming back in or bringing children in. So this is happening, and it's an ongoing kind of process with people coming in. Oh, did I hunt my mic off? I thought I heard something there. And you guys didn't hear anything, right? <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yeah. See, I learned my public speech. Well, now I'm not. I learned my public speaking skills in little Baptist churches back up in the hills of Northeast Tennessee. That's why I can't stand behind the podium. And that's why I move back and forth. And before we're through, we'll probably have an invitation to him and I'll pass the collection plate. <laughs> 
and the conservation district folks say, that's fine as long as we get the money, right? <laughs> so, but, uh, uh, so the, the linear process, I think, has changed more into something that is, that is a, an ongoing process of entry, growth, and instead of exit, let's refer to transition. And I think most of you mentioned something about wanting to transition the business to other people. That's why you're here, when David went around at the beginning. If you were just wanting to end the business and sell out and disperse the proceeds or spend all the money, you wouldn't have needed to spend a day here. You'd have just contacted Pam or some other attorney. You'd do all the paperwork and you take care of it. But I gather most of you have some interest in having the business as an ongoing or growing business. So with that, I think that model has changed a little bit over time. Now, I'm going to show you something here that I do with all of my farm management students, usually in the first or second class, where I talk about functions of management. And I'm going to do a little bit of a graphic thing here as well. The, the functions of management are planning, implementation, and control. And if you think of it this way, I could draw this in a box. And we've got planning in one line, implementation in another line, and control in another. So those are the, I, I'm, yeah, here's my planning, implementation, and control. So that's okay. Let's do it this way. I got one slide ahead. So there's planning, implementation, and control. Planning, I teach budgeting. I teach all the things we do to think about what we're going to be doing next year. I teach business planning, all these sorts of things. We're talking about transition planning, so that's part of what we're doing here now. Implementation is the real important part, because if you sit here today and think about the plans, or develop a plan, or fill out the forms that David was showing out there before break, and you develop that plan, but then don't implement it, if you don't take the action, then you're no better off. So the implementation is actually doing something, going home and getting it done. And that could be planning a crop, that could be planning a transition and succession of your business. The control function has to do with sort of, you know, it could be financial <coughs> record keeping or all the records and, and regulatory stuff that we do, or just looking back at that, say, in the context of a transition plan, does it need to be changed? So we're, we're sort of controlling the business over time. So planning, implementation, control, those are the functions. Then this next slide, has the areas of management, so if I've got planning, implementation, and control, then I can put these areas of management, which are production, the things we do, growing grapes, producing cattle, making hay, all those sorts of things, marketing of those products, and then all the financial functions. So we have three areas and three functions. So what that is, and I've used this little grid in lots of workshops we do, and I'd put this up, and I'd ask folks, okay, where do you spend most of your time? Now think about that for a second. You got production, you got marketing, you got finance, you got planning, implementation, and control. Which of those nine boxes, as in your farming, do you spend most of your time? Production. 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 Okay, that column. Which of these functions then? Planning, implementation, or control? Implementation. You've got the same thing that every other crowd that I've ever done this with before identified. This is the area, this box right here, is where most people spend most of their time. Now, it's a multi-day workshop, so we do it. I'd ask people, how much then of your time do you spend there? Implementing production, doing production. Give me some numbers. How much is your time? 75. 75%? In Madera County, Kentucky, one time a guy said 125. <laughs> it's not uncommon for folks to, to put down 75 to 90%. And I would, not, I would not disagree with that. Yes, we spend a lot of our time doing things. Now, if we do spend 75% of our time there, then what that means is we've only got 25% for all the rest of that. Now, granted, this is going to be the big area. That's where we're going to spend the most. But keep in mind that those other things are important as well. Now, I'm going to make it a little more complex than that. Because I'm going to put planning, implementation, and control. I'm going to put production, marketing, and finance. Now, I'm going to add that life cycle component.
And if I put entry, growth, and transition, then we have made management a fairly complex concept. And that looks like something that most of you remember from the 80s, right? Do you ever feel like this when you're trying to manage everything? You got three by three by three cube, and you can't ever get those things all lined up. Oh, I'm getting the orange ones. See, I would work to the orange ones first, right? That would make sense. So if I can get some of those together, management is hard. It is going to be a very difficult thing to do. Uh, with any luck, we can get it. Now, and you're thinking I stood up there and did that, right? I can't even keep my microphone on. There's no way I can do a Rubik's Cube, so I have two of these. And I had to buy an extra one of these because when my son was about six years old, he got the one that wasn't messed up and twisted it. So I had to buy another one, and this one, to work on that one. See if you can get this one to work. Can y'all hear me without this mic? I keep knocking off. Can y'all hear me okay? It's super glued. <laughs> so, but sometimes management feels like this. You've got all of these things happening at the same time. And you're thinking, and, and David, I would contend that one of the reasons we don't do the transition is one of the easiest to put off. Because all of that production stuff has to be done. The hay has to be mowed. The hay has to be raked and baled. We do those things. We respond to those, those priority items. And we do those things. And this is one that's it's uncomfortable to begin with. We've already determined that. And that we're willing to just kind of put it off for a while. But management is a hard thing to do. So it's And job security. I like teaching management. Uh, now, here's my case for management. I'm going to go through something fairly quickly here. Now, this is part of a presentation I've been doing because, as, as we've mentioned, we've had some downturns, particularly in commodity prices. Beef prices have come off recently. Dairy prices are in the tank. So times are up and down in agriculture. We've had some up times, and now we're looking at some pretty tougher times. But the good times aren't permanent, but neither are the bad ones. And part of this notion of succession planning is managing cycles and knowing that it is going to be cyclical. I had, prior to my academic career, I, I did an undergraduate degree at the University of Tennessee, and I went back into my home county, which David's from the most northeastern county in Ohio. I'm from the most northeastern county in Tennessee. He's a Yankee out of Hill Valley. <laughs> So I grew up in the mountains of northeastern Tennessee uh, on a farm that my dad said that the good Lord felt sorry for us and pulled the ground up in the middle so we could farm both sides. A uh, little hillside farm, but I went back up there and for nearly 10 years managed a farming operation that had some, a, a good uh, Creek Valley farm. Uh, they got there first, so that farm is still there. Uh, they have a land grant for King George III. It's in the, they have the state farm office. And they're into a lot of other business endeavors as well. But it was a, an interesting experience to learn that. And that's where I learned a lot of experience. In fact, that little slide there on the side, that's, that is a picture of that farm. It was a, a creek that ran through the farm uh, that Daniel Boone had named after a Roan horse. That's Roan's Creek. And, uh, and, and so a lot of history in that part of the world. And I had a lot of good experiences there. And I told those folks when I was managing that farm that, look, this is going to be cyclical. And my professional goal was to break even in the bad years and making money in the good years. And, and we were able to do that. We had some down cycles in, in commodities and, and cattle. That was what we primarily had in some tobacco. Uh, but learned, learned a lot of management skills there. Of that, and the fact that I you know, had the first 10 years of my career actually managing a farm, my wife and son and I have a little farm in a place called None Such, Kentucky. Anybody been to None Such? <laughs> You've been to none such? The, the, the Blitz, the restaurant there, or what was your? Yeah. There's a, there's a business there. Two ladies from Ashland, Kentucky, bought the old none such school building, turned it into an antique place, and had an upscale restaurant in the basement. Now, this is 10, year, 10 miles off of the nearest, I wouldn't say paved road, but, but off of the nearest good road. It's out in the country, isn't it? 
Saturday, at, this past Saturday, they had 170 people who came there for lunch. And it's a $22 plated lunch. And these are mostly ladies who come in and they'll buy the lunch and, and shop for the antiques. So I live in, in uh, Nonsuch, our son works there, we have a little farm there as well. So after managing a farm for a number of years, still keeping my hand in farming a good bit, and teaching farm management for 25 years now, I think I've earned the right to say that I have identified some characteristics of top managers, and this is my list. And I want to hit these fairly quickly, and I want to talk about this in the context, though, of transition and succession planning. You can transition the assets, but you've also got to think about transitioning the management. Because if you just transition the assets without knowing where the property boundaries are, where the pipelines are, how to plow, how to milk the cows, how to prune, prune the grapes, how to market the products, then we have probably failed our successors. So these are my 10 top traits, 10 traits of top managers. They're gold driven. All of my students get to write SMART goals. That stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time. Every student I've ever had at the University of Kentucky, that's their first assignment in class. They have to write me a set of goals, they have to write a mission statement. So we start out talking about the strategic side of management. And I think goals are critically important. One of the things, in, in, in some of these materials you've been looking through this morning, what do you want to do and why do you want to do it? That's the goals and that's the mission. Why you are here is the mission. Why you are farming is the mission. What you want to do in succession are the, are the specific goals. And I think that this whole notion of why we do this in succession planning, this needs to be shared across generations. Unless you've got buy-in from sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters, then, then we're all working at cross purposes. I've contended for a long time that every business needs somebody who every day asks the question, why are we doing this? The answer to that question is the mission for the farm, for the business, the why we're doing it. We spend all of our time on the what, for a lot of our times on the what, and the why is the really important part about it. So, uh, so share that across, across generations. Uh, in a visual sense, the mission is the foundation. That's what it's based on. The goals are the specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time things that we do. That can be everything from the, the to-do list in your pocket to the, what we want to do this year, how big we want the operation to be, what we want our yields to be. I have always been the kind of person who has, has set lots and lots of goals. The little visual I have up here for Lewis and Clark. That's there to remind me that it represents a goal that took me 27 years to achieve. Because when I graduated from the University of Tennessee the first time, back in the 70s, I set a rather odd professional goal. I had several professional goals, but one of the odd ones was that sometime or the other in my career, I wanted to take the month of October off. That seems like an odd goal. But keep in mind, I grew up in the hills of northeastern Tennessee, where October is absolutely the most beautiful time. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? I just thought I would love to be able to take October off. Well, first job out of school was managing that farm. October, busiest month of the year. Grain harvest or a tobacco farm or a feed of cattle operation. I mean, I was lucky if I got four hours of sleep a night, much less take any time off. Busy time of the year. Graduate school, not going to take time off. You can't take a month off in graduate school. Started teaching at the University of Kentucky and had me teaching fall semester. The students might have enjoyed it, but I still can't take the month of October off. In 2003, I swapped teaching responsibilities with another person in the department. I transferred to spring semester, he transferred to fall semester teaching. And in the fall of 2003, I took the month of October off. The last two weeks of October, my wife and son and I, he was about five or six at the time, we followed Lewis and Clark up the Missouri River to Lem High Pass on the Idaho-Montana border. I took that month of October off 27 years after I set that goal. But I set that goal when I was probably 21, 22 years old, and it took a long time that I was able to reach it. Goals are important things that we write down. I have a, a colleague, a former graduate student, and somebody I've worked a lot with. She says, uh, uh, an unwritten goal is just a wish. 
So I say write your goals down. So in this, write down what you want to happen. What you want to happen for your business. And it doesn't matter what size it is. Because our little 90-acre place down at Nunsuch is just as important as some 5,000-acre grain operation in West Kentucky. And my goal is that my son sometime will be able to do what he wants to do with that. So, so I think goals are important, and the tactics are the things we do. Somebody said, well, this is the big, we do most of this, and this should be the big part. No, we, this is the foundation, this is the goal, and all the other things we do are the tactics. Secondly, I'm going to get to it, I'm going to get through 10 points. Goal-driven, but secondly, data-driven. I think that, that good managers are data hounds. They like to keep track of things. They like to know things. They like to know their cost of production. Uh, we've got a grape producer here, right? They're producing grapes. We have a few grapes on our farm. And I'll show you my spreadsheets. <laughs> you know, I keep track of, of what varieties perform better than others. We took some out this year, put some others in. I want to know that. When I'm talking with managers, and I observe the top managers, the good ones tend to know what that cost per bushel, cost per hundred weight of milk, cost per hundred weight of calf. They tend to know that. Because if, if we don't know our cost of production, we don't know if we're selling that as a profit or not. Now, when I came to Kentucky, tobacco was king. You know, we grew tobacco pretty much all the way across the state. And tobacco was the kind of a crop that almost anybody could make money at. And I saw a lot of folks that did not keep good cost of production records because they knew that they were making money. In the fall of 2003 or winter of 2003, 2004, when the tobacco buyout came in and some people wanted to stay in, then I was able to go out and talk about tobacco budgets because everybody wanted to know. But I think good managers, second trait, they're data driven. They want to know, they want to measure things, they understand the value and the cost of information. Because gathering information takes some time. You gotta know that there's gonna be a return to that. Again, I'm an economist, so I want to know. If I'm gonna spend time with production records or financial records or measuring things, is that gonna give me some benefit? Is it gonna be of some value? Now, this is not quite as easy as developing a grape budget or a tobacco budget or a feeder cap budget. But what you're doing in succession planning will take some time. And it will take some money if you are getting you know, the kind of resources that you need, professional resources, to help. I think that has value. About 25 years ago, when my dad was selling out our home place, I arranged to have him sit down with a good financial uh, tax accountant. And at that time, there were some different rules on transition of, of uh, uh, your own residence and a number of things. So he was able to set some things up and, and had a pretty substantial tax savings, I think. Well, a, a couple of weeks after our initial meeting, uh, Dad called me on the phone one morning. We were talking on the phone. He said, you know, I got a, I got a bill from that account. A friend of yours said, they charged me $250. <laughs> said, yeah? I said, what's wrong with that? He said, we wasn't over there much more than an hour. <laughs> I said, Dad, how much do you think we saved on taxes? Well, I know, but ain't nobody worth $250 an hour. <laughs> now, keep in mind, this was 25 years ago. But having him understand that, that this will cost something, but it has value. And sometimes it can have value that far exceeds any rate of return. We can go out there and get it working hard. So, so I think good managers use good information, the right amount, best decisions. And finally, I think good managers live with the results. Good managers do not have excessive guilt about what went wrong in the past because they know they can't change it. I, I heard somebody uh, come out of that last week said it's okay to look look to the past as long as you don't stare. <laughs> and I like that. I mean, I get sort of nostalgic at times, but good managers don't live in the past. Good managers live in the future. That's what this whole session about today's the future. You're thinking about what you're going to be doing for your children and your grandchildren down the road. So good managers are forward-looking and, uh, and, and they live with the results. Okay, thirdly, they're leaders. They're people people. They communicate. They're going to talk about that this afternoon. And, and Matt, we know this. This is one of the hardest things that families do. So some of the things that he's going to share this afternoon I think are going to be really, really helpful. So the, the, the communication is, is tough. 
these are some of the things that I think good managers do. They're leaders. They're people people. And this is with employees. This is with family members. They're teachers. They're coaches. They encourage. They share credit. One of the simple little things I love, good managers say we a lot more than they say I. And that, that's something, it's a subtle little thing that I look for. I look for that in employees as well. I've mentioned I teach the HR for human resource management. Right? If I'm in a business, I look to see whether the employees say we or they. <coughs> if employees say we, I view that as a good indicator of management and good leadership. If employees typically say they, that tells you something different. So I'm looking for we more than I'm looking for I or they. Good managers are networked. Uh, Don mentioned that uh, one of my responsibilities at the University of Kentucky is I'm co-director of the Kentucky Agricultural Leadership Program. And that's one of the pleasures of my job. I enjoy teaching. I like teaching undergraduates. I like doing extension work. But in the Kentucky Agricultural Leadership Program, last Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we started class 11 of that program. It started back in the middle 80s of the Philip Morris Ag Leadership Program. And you may have some folks who have gone through that or know about the program. Uh, we selected 22 participants from uh, 42 people that we interviewed. So it's a very competitive process. And it's like you get to pick the A-plus students. And it is a rush to work with those folks. And they're, they're motivated, they're, they're, they want to learn, they come from different backgrounds. They, and, and we had our first seminar Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and it got off to, I think, a really good start. Of the previous 10 classes, if we ask them, what's the best thing you got out of the Kentucky Agricultural Leadership Program, they'll say the networking. Now, those 22 people, a few of them knew each other. A few of them knew of each other, but a lot of them didn't know anybody else in the class. Two years from now, when they graduate, they will be one of the most tight-knit groups you've ever seen in your life. We had the reunion of class one, which was a 30-year reunion this past summer. One of those guys in that class from down in Davis County, Owensboro, says he's done business in that first class uh, of 30. He's done business with 22 of them. And some of them he communicates with on a if not daily, at least weekly basis over the past 30 years. Good leaders, or good managers, I think, are networked. I, I was trying to think about this when I put that first line on the slide when I was working this up. I tried to think if I knew somebody that I would call a top manager that I considered was a lone wolf. And I couldn't. I couldn't come up with anybody that would make my list of top managers that does it by themselves. I just, I, I really, searched my brain to see if I could find, you know, this crusty old independent person that did everything for themselves. They didn't make the list. And you've already been introduced to this notion and concept of having a transition team, a team of advisors. Good managers know when they need to get additional support and are willing to pay for it. So, so I think good managers are network and, and not Embarrassed is too strong a word. Good managers, not just, they actively seek somebody that can address deficiencies. So we, we find uh, advice. Uh, there are several quotes, and I've been highlighting many of the quotes that have been at the bottom of these slides, but John Wooden is just, uh, uh, for those of you who don't remember, he was the basketball coach at UCLA. Won seven national championships in nine years back in the 70s. Uh, I heard him speak after he had retired. Uh, he was out on a speaking tour, and I think I was still an undergraduate in college. And you know, I'm the kind of guy that couldn't dribble a basketball with both hands. And after hearing John Wooden speak, I thought, I said, he could have made an All-American out of me. <laughs> he was that good. I mean, he just, he had some, you could tell that he got the most out of his players. And those of you old enough to remember, he built a dynasty at, at UCLA, one of the best basketball coaches ever, ever. And he said, whatever you do in life, surround your people. Smart people will argue with you. Now, there's another quote that I don't have on here. Uh, Henry Ford said, if I have two people that think the same, I don't need one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we're, we get in our comfort zone where we want to listen to people who think like we do. Be that about religion, politics, management, law, I don't care. But good managers don't do that. Good managers want to stretch that a little bit. 
They want to explore and learn and hear other things. Okay, fifth item on good manners. They're dissatisfied. It seems kind of odd to throw in a negative word into a list of top managers. But I think good managers are always looking for a better way of doing things. And I, I've been thinking about good managers. They, they are. They're, they always want a better way. They Sometimes we kind of resist change. You know, we, we're comfortable comfortable where we are. Well, good managers are looking for things to, ways to do things different. My acronym in here. They never say, we've never done it that way before, unless it's followed up by, but we're willing to try. <laughs> I've heard a lot of folks, uh, this is a, yeah, I grew up in these little Baptist churches in the hills of East Tennessee. That was our motto. Yeah, we've never done it that way before. <laughs> We're certainly not going to change. Good managers aren't like that. Good managers may say that, but they'll say, hey, we're willing to try something different. Uh, I, I like innovation. Now, just in terms of a, a, a farmer I work with in Central Kentucky mentioned this to me last summer, I think, and I put this one in. Particularly with multi-generational operations. And I started asking this question. If the, for the younger members of the family, I want to say, okay, what would you do different next year if Dad died? And we're talking about this notion of, of losing family members, but not just about the transition plan, but what would you be doing different if this was yours to run? Would you do everything the same way we've done it the last few years? Or would you be willing to try and do something different? So, so I think good managers are dissatisfied. They're not satisfied status quo. Six, they're organized. They're organized to focus to prioritize. My dad, bless his heart, taught me a lot of good lessons on that hillside farm, but prior, prioritization was not one of them because his to-do list was horizontal. Everything was on the top row. It all had to be done today. <laughs> Dang near killed me. But, but <coughs> good managers know that there are priorities and they know where those are. Now, the fact that y'all are here in this room today, I think, gives me some indication that you think this is a priority. Don't let this end here because you... This is the planning part. You've got to go to the implementation part. The transition plan is a priority. So, good managers view the future aggressively. They understand the relationship between risk and returns. If you want nice, safe returns, sell everything you've got and put it in some nice, low-yielding certificate or bond or something. That's the safe way. What is it? Uh, Dwight Eisenhower said if you're if you're afraid of risk, go to prison. You'll get <laughs> three meals a day. <laughs> but he said you give up a lot of liberty. You have a lot of opportunities. So, so good managers, I think, also understand the risk. And, and folks, families are one of the biggest risks we have. There's no, no question about that. Uh, number eight. I think good managers are smart. Now, I'm not trying to be condescending here because... And, and think that you can't be a good manager if you're dumb, but that, if you are, you better be able to do number nine, which is work hard. <laughs> but I got to thinking about good managers I've known over the years, and they were smart. They were inquisitive. They may not have been highly educated. The guy there at the quote at the bottom had a third grade education. He's one of the smartest men I've ever worked with in my life. He was sort of the crew leader at the farm that I managed in Northeast Tennessee. And that quote has to do with him teaching me how to back a four-wheel wagon. And that was the advice he gave me. And I, I rarely back a four-wheel wagon in the barn anymore that I don't think about Woodrow's advice. Because in the little hillside farm I grew up on, we didn't even have four-wheel wagons. It was two-wheel trailers to haul hay and tobacco and stuff. And I, I got out of college and couldn't back a four-wheel wagon. The first time I tried, it was awful. And I said, Woodrow, how do you back one of these things? And he said, you turn it about halfway as, think, as far as you think you need to and then start turning the other way. And maybe a pretty good life lesson in that. But, but I really think there is a high correlation between good management and intelligence and at least being intellectually inquisitive. I go in with my students. When I'm trying to teach economic concepts, which those of you who've had economics courses remember those are some of the most boring classes you ever had in your life. Well, I try to offset that. I try to teach economics with illustrations. And I love finding farmers who are good economists and don't even know it. 
And uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you one economics lesson here. Old boy back in Hills East Tennessee, he understood marginal economics. Never had an economics course in his life. Couldn't have drawn a graph. Couldn't have drawn a formula. But he was feeding the, some hogs out one time for uh, uh, to slaughter. Uh, hogs were cheap. Feed was high. And he told me, he said, Steve said every two days them hogs eat one of themselves up. <laughs> Then if I don't get them finished pretty quick, they're going to eat themselves completely up. He understood the marginal cost of feed and the marginal value of the hogs. He was a good economist. And, and, and I think good managers are good economists whether they, whether they know it or not. And then here on the transition, they want to teach the next generation. That's one of the things about people who are intelligent. They don't want to keep all that themselves. They want to, they want to share that. Here, please, son, here's how you do this. I struggle with that all the time, trying to get my son to say that, you know, I'm not just trying to give you orders, I'm trying to teach you how to do this. And, and so that's, I think that's part of it. And I'm not always giving you this one. They work hard. Uh, I got to mention, I've never met a good, what I would term a good manager, one of the top managers of lazy. Not at all. They don't necessarily spend all their time with physical work, because they understand that some things they can hire somebody else to do, but they are not lazy. And for these last two, if I had to choose between smart and work smart, I'm going to pick work smart. And when I see students, I've had some of my highest performing students were not some of the smartest students, but they did work hard. Now, the ones that really aggravate me are the ones that I think are really smart and don't work hard. I get really frustrated with those students. So, uh, uh, so they're smart, they work hard, and it's fine, I'm a chance. Many of y'all bet have read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you haven't, I strongly recommend it. It's been easy to read. Been around for years and years and years. And Covey's seventh habit is sharpen the saw. Taking time to recharge. Good managers don't work all the time. Good managers understand the value of taking a little bit of time off. That can be with family, that can be with community, that can be just away from the business. That can be playing possible. The good managers understand that. And to emphasize that point, I love the Abraham Lincoln quote. Six hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe. I, I bring that analogy into the 21st century by saying that, that most of you have tried to solve something. A locust fence post with a dull chainsaw. You know, that dull chainsaw finally becomes like a handsaw. You know, see, you know that, hand, that chainsaw, you use it just like a handsaw. 15 minutes with a chainsaw file will cut much, much better. A day spent at something like this is sharpening the salt. But it's also a day getting away and following Lewis and Clark is sharpening the salt. So those are the 10 traits of, that I have identified as top managers. And management to me is one of the really, really hard things to transfer. The assets, we know how to transfer the assets. We've got rules for that. We've got laws for that. Transferring the management is going to be very much harder. Just a bit of background information here. I'm going to wrap up uh, lunch is here in about 15 minutes or so. Uh, so this 58.3 age thing, uh, we've all seen this or heard this. Uh, so that's why I think we in Extension have seen an interest in succession planning and transition workshops in the last few years. David, I don't know, I've done a dozen or more of these in the last two years probably. Have you done that many? Probably. So, so there's demand out there for it. Part of it, I think, driven by the fact that over the last five census cycles, the principal operators have been getting older by about a year every five years. So we're 58.3. There's two occupational groups that are older than farmers. You know what they are? Two occupational groups that are, uh, have an average, higher average age than farmers. Do you know what they are? Doctors. What's that? Doctors? <laughs> no, there's a lot of them. They, they keep cranking out new doctors all the time. Yeah. Anybody, any guesses? Funeral home directors. Funeral home directors, that is a pretty, yeah. <laughs> Not, I don't think so. I didn't see them on the list. That's a good guess. Yeah. I just think they're born old. <laughs> I haven't been against all anybody in the funeral home business here. But any other guesses? Walmart greeters and school, school calls and guards. <laughs> Those are the two groups that are always in the farm. Uh, they told that, that David and I was working a good bit with is saying that 70 percent of farm ground is going to transfer because we're older and we're not going to live forever. So that's some of the background. This graphically is the age of principal operators. This was 2002. This is the 2 million farms that USDA counts. Uh, <coughs> 500,000 of them were under 45 
dropped by about 100,000 by 07, and another 50,000 out here. So only 334,000 uh, farmers under 45, while this older group, over 65, increased by about 100,000, and then roughly another 50,000 in the next census cycle. So yes, I, I agree, this is an issue, and it's what's driving some of this discussion. However, I also teach classes at the University of Kentucky to people in our 20s. And I show that slide, and then I show this one. So I say, is this a problem or opportunity? As if I'm in my 20s, this is a good deal. Because there's going to be some property transferring, changing hands. 2012 census, we had about $45 billion worth of assets. If 70% of that transitions, according to Dave Cole, that's roughly $8 million worth of assets a day that transition. Now, most of those are going to transition within families. But there's going to be a lot of asset turnover out there because that's why we're doing what we're doing. So, I think this whole concept of transition is an opportunity to do things right. Instead of this, don't worry, I'll take care of you, we ought to be saying, here's how we're going to take care of things. And if it's showing the notebooks, if it's, if it's putting that transition team together that you're going to talk more about this afternoon, which I am a firm, firm believer in, and I'm going to prime the pump for that because we're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, notion of the transition team. I have, in 23 years of extension in, in Kentucky, I have one thing that I have changed dramatically. When I came here and we had conversations about this or expanding the business or transition planning, I would say, okay, we need to get everybody together around the kitchen table and, and, and do this. Uh, I know he's going to have this in one slide. This is not a kitchen table discussion. The change that I have made is that I say don't do it at the kitchen table. Do it at some sort of a neutral site. Go somewhere else. Go to a bank board room, an extension office, uh, you know, wherever you can find a spot. Get away from the kitchen table for several reasons. Everything that's ever happened in that family, good or bad, is sitting around that kitchen table. All the emotions are there. Secondly, that kitchen is mom's turf. And there's no, I'm not against moms, don't get me wrong. But I mean, that's her territory. You, and you're probably going to come back and say some of the same things, and that's going to be okay. Go to that attorney's office. Go to that bank boardroom. Go to that extension office. Some more to a neutral site. And we'll talk more about that this afternoon. But I, that is one thing I have really changed. It's, it's, it's not, it's more than just a kitchen table discussion. Go somewhere else. Okay. Uh, you had nine questions. I've got some up here. We'll farm economic and sustain the transfer. Any kind of assets for both generations. David's talked about that some. I do want, well, and, and for the past 30 minutes or so, I've been talking about transferring management and leadership. This has been the part I really wanted you to get at. And then I do want to have this last one down here because a couple of folks did mention being here to uh, uh, manage or avoid any taxes. As it stands right now with 10.8 six million dollars worth of exemption uh, most of our farms do not have an inheritance tax issue and Penny, you may talk about the state but the state with the category A is essentially no inheritance tax in Kentucky so to me inheritance taxes while if there is a liability for any of those then that's important but I think that's been a paper title and when a politician stands up and says yes taxes, destroy the family farms. Well, you vote for them, right? Because you don't like that. Now, here's the other side of that question. I worked in extension farm management for well over 20 years. I have yet to know a farm that's been destroyed by taxes. Not even one. I've seen some damaged. I've seen some that had to pay taxes. David, have you known a farm destroyed by the <coughs> parents' taxes? I've asked other colleagues around the country, like David, that work in this farm management area, I've asked my colleagues, have you ever seen a farm destroyed by taxes? Not a one of them can say that they have. Now, if that's what gets people to the table, fine. But with good financial management and legal and tax advice, the tax implications should never destroy a farm. And I don't think they have. So I think it's, it's a bit of a paper tiger. But if you've got an estate of over $11 million, you still need to do some management of that because it's, it's just like any other taxes. I don't, I don't want you to pay a penny you don't owe, but I want you to pay every penny you do owe. <coughs> because I think that's patriotic way. But, but, but 
taxes to me are the one that has driven a lot of folks to the table that I have yet to know a farm has been destroyed by. Uh, so other questions I have here, is the farm profitable? <laughs> Give me your kids a farm that's losing money is not a favor. <laughs> so I think one of your questions was, did they really want it? Whether they want it, they want to come back. So, uh, so you got to ask that. David mentioned some things about uh, family of living, the standard of living. He had a, he threw out a number there. This is actual data from our Kentucky Farm Business Management Program. These are the last three years that we have data from. And you referenced that seventy-four thousand dollar number. He has good memory. Twenty fourteen family living expenses on one hundred and sixty-seven farms that we have good records for. Now these are, for the most part. Uh, larger commercial farms in the western part of the state. So that is not necessarily a representative sample, but it is an accurate sample. We know that that number is exactly right as an average for those 167 farms. The family living is just part of it. When taxes and Social Security are thrown in there, another 34,000, that would equate to W-2 wages of 100, over $100,000. And now the thing that alarms you a little bit is, and I think it was 2012, we had 22 farms that had over $200,000 of family living. And you're like, holy smokes, how'd they do that? Out in Hopkinsville or somewhere one night, I said, well, my guess is they gave a lot to charity. And everybody kind of laughed. But afterwards, somebody came up and said, yeah, we were in that list, but we gave a lot away. Private school tuition. I, I, I've seen a number that were over $200,000. Usually there was a lot of travel, private school tuition, or high charitable contributions were usually with what was doing that. And the Kansas data is about like this, isn't it, David? And the Illinois data somewhere in the mid-70s out of their program. Uh, so those are numbers that we have that, we're, that, that are at least accurate. Again, it's all over the board. It's from 20,000 to 250,000. We actually had one at 2.1 million. I think that was the high. But, uh, and that doesn't include uh, house payments and capital purchases. That's family living. Now, could you go back to that just a minute? I will. A, a technical question. When you look at uh, the difference, the increase, in family living expenses uh -huh. from 12 to 14 and compare that with the percentage of increase of tax and social security, how do you account for that difference in increase for taxes and social security? It, it may have been, I don't know that I can answer that because this is an aggregate. It may be that there were just more folks out there who had higher levels of income, they were paying more in self-employment taxes. Because those tax rates hadn't gone up in those right. years. That was, that was what I was saying. Yeah. yeah, that is not a reflection of tax rates. It may be that... Uh, the sampling that you did. W that's a possibility. Yeah. This is a fairly consistent sample. Mm -hmm. uh, but there may have been different levels of, of charitable contributions and things in there. That's a legitimate question, and I, I can't give you a really good answer. Because, yeah, that's, that's roughly 50% higher. Right, that's way distorted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe they just, maybe they're making so much money they weren't doing as good a job of tax management out there. I don't know. <laughs> okay. uh, financial planning. Hey, would you get have a hazard a guess? Well, just one of the things we see is RMDs. Like after they retire at a certain age, mm -hmm. they've done a good job in 401k. They have to take larger yeah. distributions. Yeah. But that might be what. Yeah, and, and there may be, there are some older farmers in this, so yeah. that may be part of it that can work as well. Okay, but, but good question. Very good. Now, uh, getting close to wrapping up here. But, I have a, this is part of my extension r and I ripped this off and duplicated it from a, a mentor of mine down at the University of Tennessee named Clark Garvin. It's on this notion of family living. And uh, you had a slide about the retired folks taking 80% of their, uh, you know, living off 80% of what they had been drawing out. I don't know how many retired folks are going to take 20% pay cut. Because if anything, some folks want to spend even more and this is the reason. Clark has the concrete theory of family living expenses, and he compares family living to concrete. And I like this. The first two are about estimating. There's no estimate, no good estimate for family living, and they're highly inaccurate unless you've got really good records. Are there any lenders in the room? I don't think the words went around. Lenders tell me that the, the one thing that they think is the least accurate item on a loan application of family living expenses. Because people guess and they tend to always guess too low. So the estimates are, are very tough to come by. The corollary for concrete is this. I know how to estimate concrete. You take the length times the width times the depth in feet 
multiply that out, divide it by 27, you've got cubic yards, you call the, the concrete plant and you order twice that much and you'll only be a little short. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you poured concrete, right? And that's about the way it goes. Family living's the same way. You estimate it, double it, and then you're still going to be a little short. So Clark, I think it's right. Business and family living expenses are difficult to separate. Lots of folks, particularly, and this is more critical sometimes for smaller firms than it is bigger ones, everything gets rolled in the same pot, the same checking account, the same coat pockets, I don't know. And, and once it gets mixed up, it's just like concrete. Once you put the water and the cement and the gravel together, you can't get it apart. Once you put all of that through the same account, it's hard to separate it out. So it's like concrete. Family living is different from rural and urban. Whoever got the notion going that it was cheaper to live in the country is full of malarkey. We drive further. Our fuel bills are higher. And, and this is not just concrete, this is not just part of concrete theory. The, my colleagues in rural sociology have looked at this and it is indeed more expensive to live in the country because a number of things are higher. Transportation is one of them, but just getting a lot of services there. It is not less expensive to live in the country. It is more expensive to live in the country. Just like the further away you are from the concrete plant, the more it's going to cost you. That's the concrete theory. Uh, budget and estimating, calculating family is hard work. Anybody who's ever finished concrete knows that it's hard work. And keeping track of family living is hard work. And then finally, the one that, that you could have guessed when I said the concrete theory of family living, once you establish family living expense patterns, they are hard to break. They get set up like concrete. We have decades of data showing farm income, you know, sort of going up and down. We talked about markets at the very beginning. So we've got this income variability. Family living expenses tend to be on an upward trend and rarely ever dip down, even in those baked beans years when you look at the aggregate. Because it gets set up kind of like concrete. It is, it is really hard, hard to do. Uh, now, once we know that, and this is again, where I, since I have this Kentucky Farm Business Manager data and I'm an economist, I've got to show you just a few numbers. They'll take my degree away if I don't put up at least a few numbers. One of the big mistakes I see my students making that are planning on going back to the farm is they kind of estimate how much additional gross income they're going to need to bring another family into the business. You don't live off of gross, you live off of net. I love your example of $500 per cow because that's the net is what you're going to live off of. You can't just increase gross by $90,000 and have family living. So, farm business analysis data for four years. This stands for net farm income from operations ratio. This is the amount of each dollar that was net in some pretty darn good years in our program. 26 cents, 23 cents, 23 cents down to 10 cents in 2014 and 2015 when those data come in and look probably even worse. So if you need $50,000 or $100,000, you've got to divide this number into that to get it. So $90,000 divided by that net farm income ratio, which is average 0.21, means that gross needs to increase by $429,000. My rule of thumb is I tell folks that if you're, you know, a net of 25% is pretty good. So if you're, if, if you can maintain that with a new family coming in, you need four to five dollars of additional gross for every dollar's worth of net that you're going to live off of. And I think we have information to, uh, to, you know, this data tends to back that up. Uh, oh, one other thing, and we're at 12, but I want to throw this one in as well. Uh, I use this one because I do some of this same work with lenders. But I want you to see this slide that I put in for lenders as well. Because as we're thinking about this afternoon, as we begin to think about putting that transition team together, that's certainly going to include a financial advisor, an accountant, an extension educator, a mentor, a mediator, uh, something like that, that lender needs to be at the table. I think that lender needs to be there, particularly if the transition is going to involve any expansion or any transition of debt. One of the big things is simply like this point of contact. Who, you know, essentially everybody has to sign the note, but usually they're, the lender just talking to one person. And if that's dad or grandpa, even the other names that are on the notes may not know what's involved out there. 
So I think that lender needs to be there. And sometimes if these folks aren't in a good farm business analysis program or have a good uh, accounting bookkeeping system set up, sometimes, lots of times, unfortunately, I see that lender knowing more about the financial status of that business than almost anybody else at the table, including the owners. And that's a bit of an indictment. So, so don't leave out the lenders. Don't, they're not just out there trying to rip you off and get more interest. If they're a part of your business as well. So make sure they include those, those as well. Um, I think what I want to do with this. Oh, one point on inflation. You mentioned inflation. Uh, this is some, I wanted to put this one in here to reinforce something that David had said. Uh, <coughs> this is 50 years of inflation. I put this up here to say that there's no one under 40 who has ever seen serious inflation and no one over 50 who's ever forgotten. Because the younger folks in the room, it's been put along down here in the 2 and 3 percent range for a good while. Those of us who have some gray hair can remember when it was up here in double digits. And then David, your rule of 72, at this rate, that's going to double every five to six years. Now, I'm not suggesting, and, and given the current financial or fiscal and financial policy, that we're going to return to those. But I do point this out to say that, that as younger people, and that's when I like having younger people in the audience, I'm, I'm going to tell them, your grandparents haven't forgotten this. They, they saw erosion of money. So that's why I just want to put an exclamation point on the thing that David said about inflation. And, you know, right now, we're, we're a tall cop. I mean... I looked this one up yesterday, it was zero. Now there's some concern if it goes negative, I think, from an economist standpoint, but 10 year, 20 year average, 30 year average are fairly low. But that 50 year average, that's that 4% number that, uh, that David used earlier. So I don't think that's a bad number to use in, in planning out for the, out for the future. Uh, <coughs> this one, and I'll wrap it up. Major challenge. Can you afford it? Is the business profitable? Will it make enough money to support multiple generations? Is there enough money there to do that? That's where you need good budgeting, good records, good financial advice. Bigger challenge, how the family wants to handle the transition. This is the communication part. But then the biggest challenge is to execute, to develop and execute that transition plan. And this is the last slide I'll put up because it'll feed into David's stuff this afternoon. Transitions fail because sometimes we mix family and business. And well, I said a while ago that I've never seen taxes destroy family farms. I've seen lots of families destroy family farms. So I think the family risk is much higher than, than the tax risk. And, and all of us could probably cite cases of, of, of families that have destroyed family farms. Uh, these unexpected events, we talked about them a little bit. Uh, sometimes just that lack of affirmation from parents not willing to turn things over. Our colleague Dave Cole tells about the 82-year-old farmer in, in uh, western Nebraska that asked him after a meeting one time and said, uh, when should I show the boy the books? <laughs> <laughs> five years later, he was out there and he still hadn't shown him the books. Five years later, the father had died in a $3 million operation was busted up because nobody knew what was going on. Uh, so sibling disputes, we talked about that. But I think the big one, I've got it in red. And that's going to set the stage for what we're going to do this afternoon about communication. I think that, to me, is the biggest reason that transitions have failed is the old cool hand loop, what we have here is a failure of communication. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue. Don, lunch ready? Any quick questions for Dr. Isaacs? He's the only thing to me between you and lunch. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Can anybody fix this one for me? <laughs>